Hi, so uh, yeah, um, I, guess, I guess Marissa gets to kind of finish everything off, so you should expect that to be the high point of the afternoon. I'm doing my best to build up to that. Um, uh, Vinod asked me to give you a kind of little primer on design thinking and kind of uh, what it might mean and what it is. I'm sure many of you already think about design. There are many startups here that I'm sure are, uh, in some ways are using design to improve the quality of your products, whether it's the website, the, the apps you, that you're shipping, maybe it's physical products. There are a few companies still doing physical products in the world. Um, uh, but I'd like, what I'd like to do over the next uh, few minutes is, is encourage you to think a little bit more broadly about how you might apply design and design thinking uh, to, your, to your business, to your strategy, maybe to your organization. So I'm going to start off with one of my favorite historical design thinkers. Uh, uh, go, coming from where I do, I like to promote British high-tech people instead of American high-tech people all the time. This, is the, this was the highest tech of them all in the 19th century, late 18th, 19th century, a guy called Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And he was responsible for some really pretty significant innovations at the time. Uh, the first suspension bridge uh, in Bristol in the west of England, the first ever tunnel under the River Thames, uh, rather high than London. And his most famous uh, innovation was one that I grew up right next to, actually, in uh, the south of England. It's called the Great Western Railway. It was the first large-scale mainline railway in the world. It went from London to the west coast uh, of, of England. And I, my favorite thing to do as a kid was to ride along the side of the... Uh, of the, of the tracks waiting for the great express trains to roar past, uh, much to the consternation of my mother, but I loved it. I think it's one of the things that actually got me to fall in love with design. So um, what's interesting about Brunel was that he was a technologist. He was working with the latest technology that was around, but he was a designer also. And, and the reason I, uh, th that I say that is because I think the way he thought about his business and the problem in front of him. So this, uh, this, is, also, this is a picture of the Great Western Railway, actually, um, uh, painted by another famous Brit, J.M.W. Turner. This painting is called Rain, Steam, and Speed, and it shows the railway going over the River Thames. Um, what Brunel talked about when he was conceiving of the Great Western uh, was not just a railway that got passengers further and faster and from one end of the country to another. He talked about wanting to create the experience of, if, for his passengers of floating across the countryside. That was his goal with his business. I want to create the experience of, for my passengers of floating across the countryside. In order to do that, he had to create the, a railway with flatter gradients than had ever been conceived of before, which meant building great long viaducts uh, over, over, over river valleys like this one here on the Thames, and some of the longest tunnels that had ever been uh, built up until that point through various uh, ranges of hills that he had to go, he had to go through. So he had this kind of holistic idea about what he, what he wanted to achieve. And he didn't just stop at building a great railway, uh, railway journey. He, he went on to consider what it would be like to create a sort of a, an integrated transportation system that might allow a passenger to embark on a uh, train in London and eventually disembark from a ship in New York, all one journey from London to New York. And this is the SS Great Western. Uh, the, one of the first transatlantic uh, steamships that he built to take care of the second half of that journey. So although this was 100 years before the profession of design actually emerged, uh, I, I, I think that uh, Brunel was really using all the principles of design thinking when he conceived of, uh, of his innovations uh, in, the, in the 19th century. And uh, so... What is it? Well, I mean, it's simplest, and it's not all overly descriptive here, but it's about applying the principles of design, what designers have always done, to a broader set of innovation challenges in business, uh, and even government and society. At least that's some of the things that, that we're, we're, we're working on today. Um, so what are some of those principles? I'm going to start off with a couple of concepts that I think are important, and then go on to a set of principles that I think you can apply in, uh, in design uh, in kind of whatever problem you're, uh, that you're facing, perhaps. So... Um, the first of those principles is to do, the, to do with the way we even think about problem solving. Um, we spend most of our educational experience through school and college being taught to think um, convergently, to being, uh, to being taught to take the best out of an available set of choices and to converge on that choice and execute. What design thinking does is encourage us to think divergently, and perhaps to create new choices that haven't existed before, and then apply those. Very simple idea, but we don't spend anything like as much time as we, as we might within, within our organizations thinking divergently. So that's the first kind of concept. The second one 
is that we also spend much of our time thinking analytically, where we pull apart a given problem and solve for one piece of it. And then maybe perhaps, if we're lucky, we assemble it back together at the end. Um, what design thinking is about is thinking in an integrated way, in a holistic way, or as uh, Roger Martin, who's the dean of the Rotman Business School in Toronto, calls it, he calls it integrative thinking. The ability to hold multiple tensions in your head at the same time and resolve for those tensions um, in an idea that solves, solves for all of them in some way. Now, the, the classic tension that we're often working with uh, in, in design and innovation um, is this one, the, the tension between desirability, what makes something, what meets the needs um, of the people that we might be designing for, feasibility, in other words, what we can do with technology to make that possible, and finally, uh, viability, uh, what makes that a sustainable uh, kind of business solution, uh, hopefully profitable business solution. And really, if you think about it, you know, any workable idea has to actually resolve for all those three. And so we ought to find ways, we need to find ways of thinking about those kind of all at the same time. So those are the two kind of, um, two, there are two concepts that I think are important to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about applying design uh, to any kind of, um, any kind of problem. But what about, what about this set of princi principles that I mentioned at the beginning? Well, the first of them is that Design is essentially human-centered. Instead of starting with technology, or perhaps even business, mostly what you're trying to do with design is start with what might meet needs, and then figure out most of the rest of the stuff afterwards. Um, what makes life easier, more fruitful? What meets the needs of, and desires of, of, of your customers, stakeholders, whoever you might be, your employees if you're designing an organization? So uh, just as an example, uh, when uh, a couple of entrepreneurs in the UK um, decided that they want to kind of reconceive the way uh, uh, baby feeding happened and baby bottles, um, we came up with a concept of taking the, the material that we've all, many of us experienced if we're skiers in those little hand warming uh, things that you can sort of boil in the water and, and, they'll, and then you crack them and they stay warm for a while. Well, they took that technology, combined it with a, ba uh, with a baby bottle to make a self-warming uh, 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 baby bottle. Um, what was really important, what they realized is they understood uh, mothers and, and the, uh, the consumers of these products more and more deeply was that actually that technology, while it made the, um, the process of, of feeding the baby simpler, um, it was not what uh, the language, if you like, of the product needed to speak about. It needed to speak about all the same things that baby products have always spoken about, comfort and, and, and reassurance, in order, to, in order to kind of meet the expectations um, of, 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 of mothers. And so uh, it's a very simple idea about you know, understanding consumers well enough that you know how to express your idea in terms of the design of the product in this case. Or in another example, uh, this is a little uh, spin-out that we did from IDEO, uh, last year called Shopwell. It's, a, it's a, a web service that's designed to help um, people shop and purchase food that m closer meets their health needs. Uh, and it's also designed to connect food producers um, with those, same, with those same, same consumers. The original concept, the original idea was, the assumption was that the users, uh, the best users for this would be people who, have, um, you know, who are vegetarian or uh, dieting or you know, people, people who sort of know they need to care about food. Um, but when they released the site and started to get early feedback and started to, started to kind of explore with it, and they actually found that, that the, the users that really most resonated with this idea were the ones that had just been diagnosed with something and that they had to move to some new, new normal. So that diagnosis might be you're just about to have a baby, so you need to eat differently, or that diagnosis might be you're diabetic. And, and that it, it was those kinds, of, uh, 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 those kinds of people that were moving to a new normal that were the right people to design this, uh, to design this for. And hence, that led uh, to some particular functionality on the site, such as the ability to take uh, an individual shopping list and trade up um, and, it, and have the site suggest trade ups to, uh, to, to, to healthier food. So that might not have been discovered um, if, unless, uh, unless they got to that level of understanding um, about, the, about the end user. So if design starts with the, with the idea of focusing on people, it very rapidly moves to the, to the idea of learning through making things. Going from speculating and thinking about what to build to building in order to think. Um, prototyping, as I'm sure many of you know, speeds up the innovation process. And as entrepreneurs, I think you probably get this 
intuitively. In large companies, people don't always get this intuitively. They, think that, they somehow think that prototypes slow things down, and that you should do lots of planning before you start to make things. But the reality is the faster you make things, the faster you put them into the real world, whether that's the physical world, if you're trying to test something, um, kind of whether something will break or whether it will work mechanically, or the world of consumers if you're trying to test its attractiveness, the faster you do that, the faster you learn about the quality of your idea, and the faster you improve it, and the faster you get uh, to an idea that's ultimately, that's ultimately going to work. So prototyping um, is, and, and speed of prototyping is absolutely essential. In fact, when we're working with large companies, one of the things we go in and look at, and indeed even measure in large companies, is what their average time to first prototype is. And uh, you know, in many industries, it's extremely slow. And it's actually an opportunity for entrepreneurs to disrupt uh, uh, large companies just through the speed in which they can go through the iterative um, prototyping process. So again, another, another startup, this is a venture-funded um, medical startup called Baxano that had um, some ideas for uh, back surgery um, tools that were more accurate, faster <clears throat> uh, than, and than existing uh, products out on the market. Uh, they went through a very, very rapid seven-week prototyping process excuse me, working directly with, um, with surgeons. And by doing that, got to um, implementable solutions and, had, uh, and were actually carrying out the first surgeries just eight months later, uh, which is years shorter than many large-scale medical companies managed, man managed to achieve um, with their development processes. So speed of prototyping um, can create enormous advantage. Now, unfortunately, one thing that I'm sure we've all found, I'm sure you've found too, is that good ideas rarely sell themselves. And the 20th century saw uh, the arrival of a whole industry that was designed to sell things and, and have us consume more. It's called the advertising industry. And, uh, and, and, and those of you who are Mad Men fans probably recognize the picture in the background. Um, but the reality is today, telling stories isn't enough. Today, what we need to do with our creative solutions is actually more like create movements. Create sort of really, real passionate involvement in the, things that, in, in the things that we create. One of the movements that I've been very interested in for a while is how to get more people out in the world involved in the design process. How to find more people like Vinod when they're younger and actually get them to be designers. Um, uh, maybe as well as being uh, venture capitalists or, uh, or entrepreneurs. They don't have to do it instead of it. So, uh, uh, something that we launched uh, last year was something called Open IDEO. It's, a, it's an open innovation platform that's designed to make the design process very accessible for people and, uh, and to tackle social innovation challenges. Um, so we've been working with a series of um, NGOs, people like the World Wildlife Fund and Oxfam uh, and, some ver and some companies to, to, to uh, tackle, uh, build a community and tackle various social innovation challenges. Um, we've got a small but passionate community of about 15,000 uh, designers around the world working on these challenges right now, which is, uh, my, my original idea was, uh, the question I asked was, uh, what happens if IDEO was 50,000 designers instead of the 500 we actually are today, but where I didn't have to hire the other 49,500? So we're on the way. We've got, we've got some of them working, working with us. And uh, uh, we, were, we were pretty excited to uh, find out last week that we've just won uh, the, uh, the Webby Award for community websites ahead of Twitter, which was a really exciting thing for the team. Um, but the first, the, the, one of the first challenges that we launched uh, was for Jamie Oliver's TED Prize last year. Uh, he uh, won the TED Prize uh, based around the idea of making food more accessible to Americans. And so we ran a challenge <clears throat> for a few weeks on the site around how to uh, uh, raise kids' awareness of, uh, of fresh food. We got we got uh, lots and lots of involvement from it. Um, we got people uh, suggesting, offering up uh, observations and inspirations, ideas that might spark other people. We got, uh, we got nearly 200 concepts. And then we also had the, the, the network actually evaluate uh, the, the various ideas and narrow it down to a smaller set. Uh, uh, everybody who's, who uh, participates in Open IDEO, <clears throat> everything they do gets measured and they get to build up their own what's called a design quotient over time. So it's kind of a score about how much you participate in the design process. <clears throat> and uh, we're already starting to get people applying to IDEO for jobs now telling us what their design quotient is, which was always one of, my, um, one of the ideas I wanted to have happen. It's an interesting measure. We may finally, somebody, may, somebody I think it was uh, a fellow from uh, 
uh, Square saying, saying the designers really didn't want to get measured or didn't think there were any metrics that, 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 uh, that were worked for them. Well, maybe this is going to be a metric that works for designers. We'll see. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we ended up with over about 100 days, 166 countries, 7,500 user, users participated, a couple of hundred concepts, and then 17 ideas that then got narrowed down. Um, ideas like this, uh, service ideas, product ideas, <coughs> some of which um, uh, Jamie Oliver's team are now implementing. So this idea of, um, of uh, creating movements, of, of getting large numbers of people to participate in whatever our ideas are, um, I think is part of a bigger idea, uh, which, which uh, I, I suspect many of you are building your companies around, which is this idea of participation. Um, uh, this notion that we're moving from <coughs> simply consuming to participating in the things that we care about. Um, and they can be products and services and all kinds of things. Um, and so design is shifting from being principally about how do we encourage uh, people to consume more to thinking about how do we create meaningful, participative uh, experiences um, that, build, that we can build value from. Uh, Paul Sappho talks about this in kind of historical terms when he talks about the 19th century really being about the industrial economy, the 20th century being the consumer economy, and the 21st century being the creator economy. And it's important to distinguish between the creator economy and the creative economy. The creative economy is the sort of thing that Richard Florida talks about and is, and is really kind of an elite idea. It's about the fact that there are certain places and parts of the world and certain aspects of the economy that elite creative people want to participate in. What Sappho is talking about is that all of us will be participating in the creator economy, often through very small um, uh, kind of creative acts. And he would include uh, constructing a search string on Google to be a, crea a creative act, where you're somehow participating in the creation of um, the value for yourself and, and in this case, uh, uh, for, 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 for Google. So it's an idea that as designers, uh, kind of we're really sort of interested in and, and kind of grappling with. And so um, when Gannett, the, uh, the, the newspaper publisher, and if there's ever an industry that's struggling with its future, it's the newspaper publishing industry, um, wanted to explore alternative um, business models, it spun, it spun uh, a small group out um, that launched this thing called the Bold Italic in San Francisco, which is a sort of citizen, new version of citizen journalism um, that meets um, kind of cla classified advertising. It's a, sort of like, it's a way of kind of replacing the revenues that they'd lost through classified advertising. And so they have a, they have a group of citizen journalists that work kind of on local events um, with local merchants and sort of somehow tie um, kind of local suppliers and local merchants and lo um, local providers um, with, uh, with news um, and, uh, and various other kind of editorial coverage. And uh, they've, uh, they've been doing relatively well and building up quite a big customer base. And I think they're about to launch in another city. But this, this kind of idea could not possibly happen without, uh, without participation because they don't have a team of professional journalists. These are all people working out um, uh, in, the, in the community. And this kind of leads to another idea uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's important, I think, when we're talking about this idea of participation. And when this is important both inside and outside organizations. And, that's, and, and it's been mentioned, I think uh, John Hennessy mentioned it, or somebody mentioned it small, uh, earlier today, which is this notion that we do everything in teams today. Um, uh, and that, uh, or it may have been Scott, that, um, uh, uh, and that, that we need to find ways of, uh, of collaborating. We need to be kind of creative about how we create uh, collaboration. Um, and uh, uh, there are certain things that tend to discourage collaboration. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one, you know, one of the things that discourages co collaboration is fear. And uh, you know, I, I, if you're like me, if you're like probably 90% of, uh, of, uh, of, of other people, you look, at this, uh, you look at this picture and you imagine yourself uh, doing what these guys are doing as they're eating their lunch on a, on a, a sort of half-constructed skyscraper above the... New York skyline, and you, can th you, you know if you were there, you would be able to think of nothing else but how am I going to get down and how, and how am I going to not die in the, next, in, the next, uh, in, the next, in the next few minutes. And when we're in these sort of fearful um, situations, it is very, very hard to think creatively. So how do we do the opposite of that? I mean, how do we create situations where we're willing to take risks, where we're willing to be playful, um, where, you know, where, where we're willing to explore um, without, without the fear of failure. And that's what great child, a great childhood is all about. Great, parent, great parenting is not uh, putting, putting kids inside a box so that they can't explore. It's giving them just enough space 
to explore in a way where the, um, the, the cost of failure is very low. Um, but the learning that comes from that failure is often, um, is often very great. And so um, while it's rare that in companies um, we're talking about kind of life and death experiences, um, those companies that rely on creativity um, uh, to be successful, companies like Google, Pixar, I, you know, IDEO, go to great lengths to create environments where um, playfulness, where exploration um, um, are possible, and where trust and playfulness is a part of the, is part of the culture. And I would, uh, I, I would encourage you to think about that a little bit as you think about building your own cultures. If you, want, if you think innovation is going to be a continued lifeblood of your organization, then think about how space and organization, how the design of space and organization um, can, support, uh, can support that goal. I mean, for instance, these are pictures from Gix, uh, Pixar's headquarters, um, which are full of these kind of weird and wonderful spaces, um, some of them for individual animators, some of them for places to people, for people to meet and, uh, and share ideas. Um, Lars Henriks, who was the founder of Zing, which is the kind of European versions of, uh, version of LinkedIn, when he wanted to, do, uh, uh, to, to uh, go on to his next venture, he thought, he thought about how could he design a new form of collaboration uh, between, uh, between what he calls software geeks and, and, uh, and funders, uh, venture capitalists. And so he created this, new, uh, uh, this sort of new venture incubator, uh, venture capital organization in Europe called Hack Forward. Um, which tries to um, you know, uh, bring together uh, angel investors or, uh, or uh, and venture capitalists and, 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 and uh, marketing experts and uh, software entrepreneurs in order to create, uh, create uh, a greater output of, new, of software innovation in Europe, which has kind of been relatively unsuccessful at that in the past uh, compared, to, compared to here. And he went through a design process to design about everything about how this organization works. So uh, this is a shot from uh, uh, while they were doing that. They worked in teams. Uh, they designed everything to do with the business model. They even, um, they even designed the legal agreement uh, to be as simple as possible to read and understand so that uh, any one of their uh, 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 kind of software geeks uh, could, could understand it without necessarily having to resort to, uh, resort to a, a lawyer. And so it was, uh, you know, what, 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 what he tried to do was kind of use design uh, to, to think about every aspect of his business, to make it as consistent as he possibly could. But perhaps the most important principle when it comes to uh, design and design thinking is this one. It's about asking the right question. Because kind of it all depends. The kind of the creative, the destination you reach when you go through any creative process so often depends on the place you start from. And there have been any number of times um, when I felt like I've gone through a great creative process and something I've designed, but started off from entirely the wrong place and therefore got to entirely uh, the, wrong, uh, the wrong answer. So I would uh, encourage you, whenever you're thinking about um, how you might tackle something creatively, to give, you, to give far more thought to the question that you're asking than you might normally. Um, you know, Brunel may have asked this question. You know, how do I take a train from London to New York or something like that? in order to get to uh, the notion of building an integrated transportation system when nobody had even heard of that term. So what are the kinds of questions that you might be asking, not only about your products and services, the kinds of the things that you're putting in front of your customers and consumers, but about your organization, about your business model, um, about your culture, about how you communicate and tell stories. These are all things uh, that you can apply uh, design thinking to. So th that's the set of principles that I've just talked about, focusing on people, building to think, prototype fast, start movements, not just uh, sell stories, enable participation, cl cultivate collaboration in your own organization and between organizations, and ask the right questions. I think they're all important principles when it comes to design. But, um, but also something else I'd say is uh, think about this in a holistic way and in order to get the most out of design thinking, design everything. OK, that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Maybe we can take two questions. Sure. Yes, Gary. How do you, could you elaborate on what you mean by raising the design quotient? Oh, so the, what, we're, what we're actually measuring, we're measuring four things uh, as people are contributing to this site. We're measuring 
any kinds of uh, 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 user, uh, any sort of inspirations they're putting onto the site. So they may have gone out and photographed users or interviewed somebody or something. We measure those. We measure their ideas. We measure, we measure whenever they evaluate ideas. And then the final thing is, um, which is actually the most important one, is we measure how much contributors build on other people's ideas. So if, you, if, they, if they go in and then there's an idea on the site and they build an idea off that idea, then they'll get, they'll, they'll, they'll get, they get especially high scores, uh, scores for that. And we, we can actually map it on the, on the site now. We, you can, uh, we can actually see where every idea, get, how it links to every other idea. And so you get these really interesting um, uh, maps emerging. In fact, the, the thing that we're finding now is uh, that ad hoc teams that are spread all over the world are emerging based on having built off these ideas. And, and, and now we're beginning to kind of formalize those teams and in some cases look for funding for them in order to take ideas forward. Thank you, thank you. I mean, process redesign is a place that, we, uh, that, that I think it's very easy to apply to these sorts of design principles to processes. Um, uh, we do it a lot in, in particular places like the healthcare industry where we're finding huge amounts of, of, um, of efficiency that can come from taking a human-centered approach to designing better, better processes, particularly with nurses and doctors, um, and, the, the, and that we can actually get better health outcomes um, uh, uh, faster by, by, by looking at it this way. Okay, thank you.